And you've already seen some movement by the Federal Reserve Board to raise interest rates. I think that's just the first of many interest rate um, inc increases that they're going to make uh, through the Fed's Open Market Committee, the FOMC. They're the ones that really control interest rates because they set the key um, uh, Fed rate and all other interest rates are, are uh, all directly geared toward that rate. And if they raise interest rates by another uh, full percentage point, I think it'll definitely slow the economy. If they raise the rate by a couple of points, it'll actually make it almost impossible for the U.S. government to service the national debt. That's how far we've been backed into a corner by the Federal Reserve. And as I'm sure most of your listeners know, the Federal Reserve is not a government agency. Only one individual on the Federal Reserve is a federal appointee, and that is the Federal Reserve chairman. The rest of the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors are, are not elected or appointed. They are merely representatives of a private banking cartel. I like to say that the Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. So do you think they're actually doing this on purpose? They decided, you know, OK, here's Trump. He became president. Let's raise the interest. Rate. I mean, because we saw them raise the interest rates in December of 2016. And then as soon as he was in the presidency, they said, OK, let's raise it again. And we haven't seen this over the eight years. So from your what you're saying is you're saying they're doing this on purpose now. I think they are, and uh, I think they're trying to be subtle about it. They, they can't just jump in and say, okay, we're going to do 150 basis points. I think they're going to incrementally turn the screws on the Trump administration, and if especially if Trump starts making any noises about reforming the Federal Reserve or about issuing U.S. Treasury notes to circulate side by side alongside Federal Reserve notes, uh, that's when I think they're really going to drop the hammer on him. But just in general, they're unhappy with Trump, and I think they're going to incrementally raise interest rates to kind of uh, sour the milk. They're going to try to s slow the economy down. They're going to make, uh, you know, for years and years, uh, the Federal Reserve has kept interest rates artificially low. So they have the excuse to raise them again because they've been artificially low for so long. We've been in, in zero interest rate policy for a long time, and now they're uh, effectively in negative interest rates if you adjust it for inflation. So they, they certainly have all the justification in the world for raising rates, and I think they're going, going to continue to do so as long as they are displeased with Trump and his policies. So you don't think uh, Trump is an insider? I mean, many people say, oh, no, he's an insider. We're being fooled. Do you think he's an insider or outsider? I think a, a number of people on his cabinet are insiders, but he personally, I think, still considers himself a white knight and he still considers himself an outsider. He does have a lot of business interests, a lot of banking interests, a lot of corporate interests, but that doesn't make him an insider. I, I don't think he is, you know, if you want to see an insi insider, uh, you know, <laughs> Look at people in the mainstream media like Andrea Mitchell, who's, who's married to Alan Greenspan, for goodness sake. Um, or look at the, the nepotistic relationship between the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury and the uh, federal regulators for, uh, on the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's like a revolving door. We had the debt ceiling date come up on March uh, 15th, and it wasn't even out in the corporate media. No one really even mentioned it, actually. It just kind of blew by and nothing really happened. We haven't hit the $20 trillion mark. I mean, during Trump's campaign, he says, you know, the, the debt ceiling shouldn't have been raised, and it was in the past, and he was kind of against it. What do you think he's going to do this time? Because eventually we're going to reach that $20 trillion, and we're going to run out of funds. So what happens? The president heads the executive branch branch, it's Congress that holds the purse strings. And unless he can get the cooperation of Congress, which he doesn't seem to have, and I think his attempts to disassemble Obamacare is, is prime evidence that he does not have the cooperation of Paul Ryan and the Republican uh, majority Congress, the, the cooperation just isn't there. And unless uh, 
all that he can really do is veto budgets and poss- and you know cause another um, crisis, as we saw a few years back, where the there was a crisis over the federal debt ceiling, and uh, we had no working budget. Beyond that, there's not a lot the president can do. Uh, luckily, I, I think because Trump is a really good communicator with the public, a lot like Reagan was, I think he might make an appeal to the American people and urge them to insist uh, with their Congress mem- members that they hold the line on the budget and that the, the that not only the executive branch, but also Congress starts disassembling some of these federal agencies, start scaling back federal spending and um, puts uh, America's uh, that the federal government's uh, budget back uh, close to being balanced. I think that's his goal. But I think that circumstances are probably going to get in the way of that goal because there'll probably be a crisis, whether it's a foreign military intervention or whether it's a financial crisis or a monetary crisis. A cruel reality is going to step in and thwart his plans for scaling back government. In fact, if anything, if there is a crisis, uh, it'll be used as the excuse for more government, bigger government, more deficit spending. And on and on we go. When you say crisis, like just to tell everyone, what do you mean by crisis? Well, if it's a military crisis, it could be a a um, a, a, a out and out uh, confrontation with North Korea. We could have a confrontation with Russia. We could have a uh, a proxy confrontation with Russia uh, in Syria. There could be the Syrian civil war could spin into a regional war and then a world war. We could literally have World War Three. And of course, the the other imponderable is the situation with China and their territorial expansion in the South China Sea and their construction of artificial islands that are basically being used like giant aircraft carriers. There's any number of crises that could get completely out of control globally that could be used as the excuse for more government, bigger government, higher taxes, higher debt ceilings, the whole works. That's internationally. Domestically, we could have a monetary crisis. We could have a a, a debt crisis, or we could have a um, financial crisis with uh, perturbations in interest rates, as, as we alluded to Uh, earlier in this conversation. So there's any number of different crises that could come to the fore and basically uh, push the Trump railroad off onto a siding. All of his plans for scaling back government could just go by the wayside. I just wanted to talk about uh, North Korea for a second, because in the corporate media and Tillerson and Nikki uh, Nikki Haley and, and the rest, they've been pushing the idea that uh, North Korea is going to develop this nuclear weapon. They'll make it small enough to put it on top of a, a missile system. We know that North Korea has been testing some missile systems. Are they leading Trump down this path to get to war with North Korea? I, I don't know whether it's intentional or not. And a, a lot of the North Korean threat actually has been exaggerated. To begin with, to the best of my knowledge, and I do have some some contacts within the Department of Energy on this. To the best of my knowledge, North Korea only possess, possesses fission bomb technology, not fusion bomb technology. Basically, that means they have the A-bomb, they don't have the H-bomb. And for a real credible threat to the United States, uh, where they might have a chance to actually challenge the United States and get into a nuclear standoff with the United States, they would have to have H-bomb technology because traditional fission bombs, Hiroshima-style bombs, just don't, don't, they don't match up. Uh, If we had, if they were to drop or deliver somehow a fission bomb to the United States, uh, that would cause massive damage, but it would not take down the United States. In response, the U.S. would rain down multiple hydrogen bombs 
mainly on Pyongyang and on uh, military marshalling yards and major military complexes in North Korea, the, the response would be so devastating and so disproportionate that I don't think that Korea would even attempt it in the first place. Until they get into the into the fusion bomb arena and until they have true intercontinental ballistic missile delivery means, and right now they really haven't demonstrated that, I don't consider them a credible threat. That's not to say that because uh, Kim Jong-un is not absolutely bat Schumer crazy that he might actually do something just on, you know, just <laughs> have a wild hair and just do it um, w without any care to the consequences. That That's always a possibility. But that's more or less a black swan event. Uh, again, unle unless or until North Korea develops fusion bomb technology and true ICBMs, they're not a credible threat. And I think that any posturing that's going on right now within the administration or from within the Pentagon is just that, only posturing. From your sources, have you heard anything about the U.S. preparing some type of covert mission into North Korea? Um, there are certain individuals. I haven't heard anything along those lines, and even if I had, I probably would admit it publicly. But no, I, I, I certainly have not. And I think it would be foolish for the U.S. government to do anything provocative, because if then uh, if if news of that got out and then North Korea did uh, detonate a fission bomb inside the United States, that would be not only the end of an American city, it would also be the end of the entire Trump administration. Trump would be run out on a rail. So they can't even plan for something like that uh, and uh, have that become public knowledge. I, to the best of my knowledge, there is no such uh, planning going on. And if anything, I think it's just a matter of some retargeting that's going on right now with MIRV missiles uh, coming out of, uh, you know, Montana, Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana or, or, or coming more likely depressed trajectory MIRVs coming off of Trident submarines. Uh, with tra with depressed trajectory, there's basically no warning before those missiles uh, MIRV and then those warheads detonate uh, on or above their targets. What is then the purpose of them continually pushing out the idea that North Korea is coming to get us? I think it's more political than anything else, and a, a lot of it inevitably goes back to the personality of the third generation of, of North Korean leaders with uh, Kim Jong-un. Uh, he is a very unstable guy, and uh, he's been parodied, he and his father were both parodied horribly uh, by the American mass media, uh, you know, the, the classic I'm so ronery routine. Uh, He's, he's easy to pick on, and he's easy to turn into a, a the, the bogeyman to be afraid of by folks, especially, I hate to say it, there's some within the Pentagon who are actually playing up these fears. You don't think that maybe, I mean, I heard some talk about um, they were using some type of cyber warfare to uh, redirect uh, North Korea's missiles where they, you know, flew them off into the ocean. They didn't work that well. I, I, I hate to say it, but you can't really use cyber weapons on a, com on a country that is essentially a dark country. If, if you look at a satellite picture of East Asia at night, you see this big black blob uh, just north of South Korea. That's North Korea. And there's only you see one or two little lights for Pyongyang and that's it. North Korea is still essentially living in 1950s technology. They their level of automation is very low. Their they, their computing systems that they have are discrete, isolated, essentially air gapped systems. You're not, Unless you have a human agent who's going to uh, insert a program, a virus or uh, a Trojan horse worm, whatever, into 
the computing system that they use for uh, their missile systems, and, and so far as I know, the missile systems they have are not long range, you're basically not going to be able to affect the, those computing systems. It's not like uh, the Western powers that are where everything is interlinked and intertwingled. Uh, you, you really don't have the opportunity to get a virus into their system because all their systems are air gapped. And frankly, I think that the vast majority of their systems are not even computerized to begin with. We're talking dumb atom bombs, dumb fission bombs that would be dropped uh, from a plane or um, perhaps transported on a short to medium range missile. They just don't have the technology and you can't exploit technology that doesn't exist. So the talk of, I mean, what you're saying is that since they're not as developed, all this talk about North Korea cyber attacking Sony and the rest is kind of hard to believe. Yeah, they, um, it, it, this just, that's just not credible simply because there just aren't, <laughs> there just aren't enough computers in North Korea and there's not enough connectivity from North Korea, except a bit through China, uh, for them to, to even have a cyber warfare uh, force that's, that's in any way, any way capable. A lot of the, the pictures that you see coming out of North Korea uh, show older generation tech, uh, technology computers sitting on desktops with traditional CRT screens, they are not even they haven't even switched to flat panel uh, monitors for these computers. That shows you how out of date they are. Um, and these banks of computers that I think are just publicity photos. I don't think they really even have much of a a legitimate cyber warfare apparatus, unless China has somehow um, subsidized and um, provided them the technology, I don't think it even exists. I wanted to talk about being prepared. I mean, a lot of people ask me, you know, what should I do? And I know that you've written many different books on uh, being prepared and different scenarios that might arise. I wanted to know, are there different plans if there was an economic collapse compared to a countrywide terrorist attack compared to maybe an EMP detonation or a war or a nuclear war? Are there different ways to prepare or are they all the same? They're all essentially the same because the real linchpin, if you look at any of those scenarios, is the American power grid. And there's three grids, an eastern grid, a western grid, and a Texas grid. If those grids go down, all bets are off. And any number of things could trigger those grids to go down, whether it's a, uh, a computer virus or whether it's influenza, whether it's an economic collapse or whether it's a, uh, a terrorist dirty bomb going off. There's a number of different things that could start a cascade of events, a chain of events, that would end up with the power grids going down. And because we have a society that's so incredibly complex and dependent on computing and electronic banking, electronic inventory control, the whole works, it's all so dependent upon the internet and on the power grid, that's the real linchpin. And once that the grids go down, all bets are off. What do you put the odds at that the power grid could come down? I would say in our lifetime, there's probably a close to 50-50 chance that we could see the grids go down for a, a period of more than a few weeks. And that is, from an actuarial standpoint, is a very scary figure because if the grids do go down for more than a couple of weeks, we're going to see massive loss of life, chaos in the cities, and it, it could even get to the point where, as I portray in my novels, that it's just not recoverable, where you have a, a complete societal collapse that's triggered by the grid collapse. Now, I was in um, Manhattan. I, I worked in Manhattan in 2003 when the East Coast power, you know, was shut down. And I was in New York and it was completely black. It was 
completely dark. And the first two days, people were actually in a very good mood. I mean, stores and, and bars, they were selling beers for like a dollar or things like that because they're trying to get rid of their supplies because they had no refrigeration. What I did notice, though, in New York is a lot of the office buildings who had generators, they didn't have the fuel to continually keep them operational. After a couple of hours, the building started to go black. And on the second day, they couldn't get fuel in there to keep them operational. I mean, when when you're saying there is a, if there is a, a grid down type of scenario, what, what do we, uh, what should we expect, you know, day one, day two, I, kn I know what I saw in New York, day three, day four, what are we going to see? Well, the crucial thing is around day three, where the uh, gravity tanks for the uh, domestic water supply start to run dry. Most people don't realize that most of the water systems for the cities is not gravity fed. There's only a few cities in the United States that have gravity fed systems from end to end. And um, one of those is San Francisco, for example. That water all comes from high up in the Sierra Nevada mountains and it's gravity fed all the way from the dam all the way to people's taps in San Francisco. But cities like that are a, a tiny minority. Most cities require grid power to pump water up to gravity tanks that then serve the, uh, the, the lines. And if there's a grid down situation, the pump stop running, the gravity tanks will be dry in about three or four days. And that's where the real crisis sets in, because not only do you have uh, people without water and desperate and fleeing the cities, you also have a public health nightmare because toilets are no longer flushing. And we have a society that's highly urbanized and accustomed to being urbanized. They don't really don't know how to revert to uh, digging latrines and slit trenches and such that. Uh, they just don't have the common sense not to foul their own uh, open water supplies. So all the, the creeks, the ponds, the streams will all be fouled by human waste. Uh, and very shortly after the civic water supplies are disrupted, we're going to have a public health nightmare. We're going to have uh, huge epidemics that spring up very quickly. So in this power grid scenario, do you see people on the move, like leaving their area? Yes, especially in starting in the southwest, cities like uh, Phoenix and Tucson, uh, where people will immediately recognize, hey, we're out of water and we're going to die. They're, they're going to hop in their cars and go. And you're going to see the highways and freeways turn into massive linear parking lots very quickly, starting in the southwest and then eventually all over the country. Because uh, even people who are on well water, even people who are on well water with a backup generator don't a lot of them don't realize that their well pumps are 220 volt well pumps and their backup generators are 120 volt AC generators. They can't they can't run their well pumps. So a lot of people have this false sense of security that they're prepared. Even some people in that category are going to end up as refugees. The loss of life that we stand to see from this will be huge. There'll be massive dislocation of people. There'll be uh, just our, a huge segment of our population is, has chronic medical conditions. They're either dependent on um, insulin, on uh, CPAP breathing machines, on medical oxygen, on kidney dialysis. There's a lot of people that without grid power are just going to plain die. Now, I wanted to compare what we just said about the power going down, the grid shutting down, to being prepared for an economic collapse and how it differs. So let's say the power stays on, but the economy collapses. Then we'll have more, something more like the depression of the 1930s, but on steroids, where we're going to see a lot more civil disruption, uh, a lot more riots, looting, uh, bank robbery, all of that going on, uh, simply because we have a society that is far less homogeneous than our society in the 1930s, and more importantly, because we have a society which, with much more stratification and specialization. Back in the 1930s, 
still 20% of American families were actively engaged in farming, fishing, or ranching. Now 1% of the population is feeding the, the other 99%. And because of that, we really don't have the opportunity to revert. People don't have the country cousins they once had. And if we have an economic collapse, uh, the level of starvation is going to be huge. And the, the concomitant level of civil disruption is going to be enormous. It's going to make the depression of the 1930s seem mild by comparison. Now, do you think people would stay in one spot during an economic collapse? Because during a power grid, you say they, they'll be on the move. With an economic collapse, you think more people will stay in their homes and hunker down? And yes. And I, hunker a, down? a lar much larger um, portion of our society, folks will just stay at home stay glued to their televisions. They'll, um, in the big cities, there'll be a lot of huge riots and protests and uh, maybe even some organized looting that goes on. But the majority of people are going to stay put if it's simply an economic collapse and it's grid up. But again, if it's grid down, all bets are off because then the great golden horde migration takes place. The people that are staying home in the economic collapse, if the grid is up, will they have problems getting food? Will they have problems getting water? Will they have problems? I mean, because if there is an economic collapse, what about the the electrical facilities, the gas facilities? Are, is everything still operational? Even if, it, even if it's grid up, there's still a tipping point that takes place. And that is if the, the drivers of the 18-wheel trucks that deliver groceries to the big cities every day no longer feel safe driving into those cities because of widespread, widespread uh, rioting and looting, if they're afraid that they're going to become the next Reginald Denny and um, be pulled out of their truck and see their truck looted, they're simply not going to drive into those cities. That's the tipping point where even if it's grid up, we could still see a full-scale societal collapse. Let me take this one step further. What happens um, if we get into war? Because, it, you know, there's a lot of war talk out there. And during World War I, World War II, war was really fought overseas. We, I mean, the people live, who were living in the United States really didn't see anything. If there's a World War III scenario, will the war be contained overseas? I don't think so. No, I, I think we're at the very least we're going to see a lot of terrorist events uh, or we could see the uh, infiltration of uh, terror teams from nation states, not just terrorist groups that are ideologically driven. But we could see nation states sponsored terrorist groups, more or less like the Spetsnaz, infiltrating to contaminate water systems, to uh, set off dirty bombs to spread um, biological warfare vectors. There's any number of different things they could do to cause tremendous chaos, but the majority of the targets will be in big cities. For anyone living uh, in the suburbs, they might be partially affected. For anyone living way out in the hinter boonies, you'll probably be safe. So it's just one more reason to, to head for the hills to move to a lightly populated area that's well removed from major population centers. But when you say hit the cities, you're talking about missiles, like hitting the cities? Is uh, even it, Whether it's missiles or whether it's terror, terror attacks, terrorists don't attack where the population density is light. They, they attack where they get their biggest bang for the buck and where the mass media is present to publicize it because that's what they're really after. They want to instill terror into the hearts of the citizenry, and you do that with television cameras. So you go where the television cameras are, the big cities. So for your advice to people, when we talk about all these different scenarios, what is the best way to prepare for this? What, what should they have on hand? Well, people need to, to stock up, they need to team up, and they need to train up. People need to have at least a three-month food supply on hand. I, I think three years is more prudent. and People need to team up with their neighbors and they need to train up essentially to create a um, like a neighborhood watch on steroids. And that is best done in a small town environment or in the countryside. 
And once you have a population over about 5,000 people, it's really hard to maintain any kind of law and order because you kind of lose the whole concept of the, of the we, we, they paradigm. I talk about that in my blog. If you go back through my blog um, archives at survivalblog.com, I, I posted an article a few years back that was called uh, Mineshaft or Gemeinschaft. And, or, and I also did an article on the we, they paradigm. It's only when you have a small town that you have a sense of cohesion and where you have the opportunity to essentially barricade a town and uh, filter out the bad elements coming into the town where you don't want to have uh, gangs of looters coming into your town. It's really it might even come to a situation where you have to roadblock cities and you can only do that in a town that has a population of somewhere between uh, 300 to 500 and a, t a population of about uh, five or se five to 7,000. Any smaller than that lower number, and you don't have enough manpower to maintain roadblocks 24 hours a day, 360 degrees around a town, and any population higher than that, you lose the sense of cohesion. So it only leaves really a... Uh, a certain number of cities, of small towns, that are a sufficient distance away from the major metropolitan areas that they're not going to be immediately swarmed that are going to be your best opportunities. Those are your best locales for relocation strategically. James, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, once again, how can people see your work and, and get your books? Again, it's at survivalblog.com, and all of my books are available at public libraries. I'm not here to sell books, uh, but I've had uh, three nonfiction books published, uh, two of which have been bestsellers for uh, Penguin, and I've also published seven novels, three of which have been New York Times bestsellers. Uh, that's the Patriot series, and my new series is called The Counter-Caliphate Chronicles. So the first book of that has been published. But again, uh, everything that financial crisis with uh, perturbations in interest rates, as, as we alluded to uh, earlier in this conversation. So there's any number of different crises that could come to the fore and basically uh, push the Trump railroad off onto a siding. His, all of his plans for scaling back government could just go by the wayside. I just wanted to talk about uh, North Korea for a second, because in the corporate media and Tillerson and Nikki, Hale, uh, Nikki Haley and, and the rest, they've been pushing the idea that uh, North Korea is going to develop this nuclear weapon. They'll make it small enough to put it on top of a, a missile system. We know that North Korea has been testing some missile systems. Are they leading Trump down this path? to get to war with North Korea? I, I don't know whether it's intentional or not. And a, a lot of the North Korean threat actually has been exaggerated. To begin with, to the best of my knowledge, and I do have some, some contacts within the Department of Energy on this, to the best of my knowledge, North Korea only possess, possesses fission bomb technology, not fusion bomb technology. Basically, that means they have the A-bomb, they don't have the H-bomb. And for a real credible threat to the United States, uh, where they might have a chance to actually challenge the United States and get into a nuclear standoff with the United States, they would have to have H-bomb technology. Because traditional fission bombs, Hiroshima-style bombs, it just don't don't they don't match up uh, if we had if they were to drop or deliver somehow a fission bomb to the United States uh, that would cause massive damage but it would not take down the United States in response the US would rain down multiple hydrogen bombs mainly on Pyongyang and on um, military marshalling yards and major military complexes in North Korea, the, the response would be so devastating and so disproportionate that I don't think that Korea would even attempt it in the first place. Until they get into the, into the fusion bomb arena and until they have 
true intercontinental ballistic missile, and uh, we had no working budget. Beyond that, there's not a lot the president can do. Uh, luckily, I, I think because Trump is a really good communicator with the public, a lot like Reagan was, I think he might make an appeal to the American people and urge them to insist uh, with their Congress mem members that they hold the line on the budget and that the, the that not only the executive branch, but also Congress starts disassembling some of these federal agencies, start scaling back federal spending and um, puts uh, America's uh, that the federal government's uh, budget back uh, close to being balanced. I think that's his goal. But I think that circumstances are probably going to get in the way of that goal because there'll probably be a crisis, whether it's a foreign military intervention or whether it's a financial crisis or a monetary crisis, a cruel reality is going to step in and thwart his plans for scaling back government. In fact, if anything, if there is a crisis, uh, it'll be used as the ex excuse for more government, bigger government, more deficit spending, and on and on we go. When you say crisis, like just to tell everyone, what do you mean by crisis? Well, if it's a military crisis, it could be a a um, a, a, a out and out. Uh, confrontation with North Korea. We could have a confrontation with Russia. We could have a, uh, a proxy confrontation with Russia uh, in Syria. There could be the Syrian civil war could spin into a regional war and then a world war. We could literally have World War III. Uh, and of course, the, the other imponderable is the situation with China and their territorial expansion in the South China Sea and their construction of artificial islands that are basically being used like giant aircraft carriers. There's any number of crises that could get completely out of control globally that could be used as the excuse for more government, bigger government, higher taxes, higher debt ceilings, the whole works. That's internationally. Domestically, we could have a monetary crisis, we could have a, a, a debt crisis, or we could have a, um, the Federal Reserve has kept interest rates artificially low. So they have the excuse to raise them again because they've been artificially low for so long. We've been in, in zero interest rate policy for a long time, and now they're uh, effectively in negative interest rates if you adjust it for inflation. So they they certainly have all the justification in the world for raising rates, and I think they're going co going to continue to do so as long as they are displeased with Trump and his policies. So you don't think uh, Trump is an insider? I mean, many people say, "Oh no, he's an insider. We're being fooled." Do you think he's an insider or outsider? I think a, a number of people on his cabinet are insiders, but he personally, I think, still considers himself a white knight. And he still considers himself an outsider. He does have a lot of business interests, a lot of banking interests, a lot of corporate interests, but that doesn't make him an insider. I don't think he is, you know, if you want to see an insi insider, uh, you know, look at people in the mainstream media like Andrea Mitchell, who's, who's married to Alan Greenspan, for goodness sake, um, or look at the the nepotistic relationship between the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury and the uh, federal regulators for uh, on the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's like a revolving door. We had the debt ceiling date come up on March uh, 15th, and it wasn't even out in the corporate media. No one really even mentioned it, actually. It just kind of blew by and nothing really happened. We haven't hit the $20 trillion mark. I mean, during Trump's campaign, he says, you know, the, the debt ceiling shouldn't have been raised, and it was in the past, and he was kind of against it. What do you think he's going to do this time? Because eventually we're going to reach that $20 trillion and we're going to run out of funds. So what happens? The president heads the executive branch branch, it's Congress that holds the purse strings. And unless he can get the cooperation of Congress, which he doesn't seem to have, and I think his attempts to disassemble Obamacare is, is prime evidence that he does not have the cooperation of Paul Ryan and the Republican uh, majority Congress, 
the the cooperation just isn't there. And unless uh, he, all that he can really do is veto budgets and poss- and you know cause another um, crisis, as we saw a few years back, where the there was a crisis over the federal debt ceiling, and you've already seen some movement by the Federal Reserve Board to raise interest rates. I think that's just the first of many interest rate. Um, in, increases that they're going to make uh, through the Fed's Open Market Committee, the FOMC. They're the ones that really control interest rates because they set the key um, uh, Fed rate and all other interest rates are are uh, all directly geared toward that rate. And if they raise interest rates by another uh, full percentage point, I think it'll definitely slow the economy. If they raise the rate by a couple of points, it'll actually make it almost impossible for the U.S. government to service the national debt. That's how far we've been backed into a corner by the Federal Reserve. And as I'm sure most of your listeners know, the Federal Reserve is not a government agency. Only one individual on the Federal Reserve is a federal appointee, and that is the Federal Reserve chairman. The rest of the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors are are not elected or appointed. They are merely representatives of a private banking cartel. I like to say that the Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. So do you think they're actually doing this on purpose? They decided, you know, okay, here's Trump. He became president. Let's raise the interest rate. I mean, because we saw them raise the interest rates in December of 2016, and then As soon as he was in the presidency, they said, "Okay, let's raise it again. And we haven't seen this over the eight years. So from your what you're saying is you're saying they're doing this on purpose now. I think they are. And uh, I think they're trying to be subtle about it. They they can't just jump in and say, "Okay, we're going to do 150 basis points. I think they're going to incrementally turn the screws on the Trump administration and if especially if Trump starts making any noises about reforming the Federal Reserve or about issuing U.S. Treasury notes to circulate side by side alongside Federal Reserve notes, uh, that's when I think they're really going to drop the hammer on him. But just in general, they're unhappy with Trump. And I think they're going to incrementally raise interest rates to kind of uh sour the milk. They're going to try to s- slow the economy down. They're going to make, uh, you know, for years and years, uh, delivery means. And right now they really haven't demonstrated that. I don't consider them a credible threat. That's not to say that because uh, Kim Jong-un is not absolutely bat Schumer crazy that he might actually do something just on, you know, just <laughs> have a wild hair and just do it. Um, w- without any care to the consequences. that That's always a possibility. But that's more or less a black swan event. Uh, again, unle- unless or until North Korea develops fusion bomb technology and true ICBMs, they're not a credible threat. And I think that any posturing that's going on right now within the administration or from within the Pentagon is just that, only posturing. From your sources, have you heard anything about the U.S. preparing some type of covert mission into North Korea? Um, There are certain individuals. I haven't heard anything along those lines, and even if I had, I probably would admit it publicly. But no, I I certainly have not. And I think it would be foolish for the U.S. government to do anything provocative, because if uh, if, if news of that got out, and then North Korea did uh, detonate a fission bomb inside the United States, that would be not only the end of an American city, it would also be the end of the entire Trump administration. Trump would be run out on a rail. So they can't even plan for something like that uh, and uh, have that become public knowledge. I, To the best of my knowledge, there is no such uh, planning going on. And if anything... I think it's just a matter of some retargeting that's going on right now with MIRV missiles uh, coming out of, uh, you know, Montana, Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana are are coming more likely depressed 
trajectory MIRVs coming off of Trident submarines. Uh, with, tra with depressed trajectory, there's basically no warning before those missiles uh, MIRV and then those warheads detonate uh, on or above their targets. What is then the purpose of them continually pushing out the idea that North Korea is coming to get us? I think it's more political than anything else. And a lot of it inevitably 